Right, so I'm going to be talking about the most incredible space telescope we've ever had, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. And I want to start, though, by introducing myself a little bit. So I grew up in, uh, if I can forward my slides there, uh, I grew up in Sweden, small town Sweden. And like a lot of people, I did not know what I wanted to do for a, for a job, right? And so we had some options at college to take uh, optional courses. And uh, my, my neighbor, also called Henrik, one of my best friends, he took an astronomy class. And so I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no interest in astronomy at the time. And I just took it so we can hang out and just chat. Uh, and it turned out I just loved astronomy. Everything about that subject tickled me. Everything was interesting. And so a few years later or a year later, uh, it was my dad's 50th birthday. We had a big thing, went over to London to celebrate. Uh, and on the way out uh, on the train, I went to a news agent and I bought a copy of Astronomy Now. And right in the middle of that magazine was this educational supplement, which listed all the courses, all the astronomy courses across the UK. And the picture on the right there was the front cover of that educational supplement. And that's the one of the teaching telescopes at the Mill Hill Observatory, which is the University of London Teaching Observatory. And I thought like, whoa, I can go to London, possibly the greatest city in the world, and study astronomy, a subject that I've grown to absolutely love. And so that's what I did. Uh, oh, by the way, on the, on the left there is it was a movie anyway, stop now. I can play again. There's a movie of Northern Lights seen from just outside my hometown. And I'm embarrassed to say, while whilst I lived in Sweden <clears throat> as, as a kid, I never saw the Northern Lights. Must have just never looked up or something. I will come back to talk about Northern Lights a bit later. So now, so after my undergraduate at UCL, I went on to do a PhD in planetary science, also at UCL. So I studied the giant planets of our solar systems. That's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. I studied these planets using, for example, telescopes on the ground. So on the bottom right, bottom left, sorry, we have the very large telescope in Chile. I also use spacecraft, just such as the Cassini spacecraft, which orbits Saturn between 2004 and 2017. And now, of course, we have the Juno mission at Jupiter taking observations uh, probably as we speak. So that's sort of a bit of a background of what, what I do now. And then of course, right now, I'm using the James Webb Space Telescope to look at these four planets. But I thought we'd start really at the very beginning, and that is addressing the question, why do we want to put telescope in space in the first place? You know, there's plenty of room on the ground. We can just put telescopes in the ground, point it at, say, Jupiter, and that's our data. Well, here's a picture of the Royal Greenwich Observatory in London. Uh, and you can see on the, the, the movie on the right there that when you point the telescope, say, at the moon, what you see is actually quite a wobbly image. So this is the turbulence of our atmosphere changing the, the direction of the, the light that travels into the Earth, into our telescope. And so it becomes blurry and it wobbles about. So the atmosphere, our atmosphere is actually our enemy when we're trying to, trying to take clear pictures of anything in the sky, right? So at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, there, is, there are about 60 clear nights a year as well. <laughs> the UK is obviously not the best place to do astronomy in the world, given the weather. So the next thing you can do, you can move up, say, on a, on, onto a big mountain, and this is uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, one of the best sites to do astronomy uh, on the Earth. So I actually took this picture. This is about six o'clock in the morning after a long observing run. And I'm looking west. And so here we have the shadow of the mountain. You can actually see the shadow of the mountain, this triangle peak dark thing as the sun rises behind it. On the left, you have the Keck telescope, one of the largest optical telescopes in the world. And this is a great site to do astronomy because you're really high up, which means you're above most of the atmosphere. All the turbulent atmosphere sits below you. You can actually see some clouds uh, down there, which is a real weather, tropospheric uh, 
weather region, essentially. And so you move up in altitude, you miss a lot of the clouds, and you have a much better view of the universe than you would from, say, the ground. So on Mauna Kea, you have about 300 clear nights a year compared to the 60 nights a year you have at the Royal Greenwich Observatory. So you can do a lot more work uh, at Mauna Kea compared to Greenwich, right? So the next thing, you're atop a mountain. The next thing, of course, is to forego the whole atmosphere altogether. And so you can launch a telescope into space and then you're outside the atmosphere and it's not a problem at all. So the first, there's been many space telescopes, but really the first one, the first famous one was, of course, the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope was launched about 34 years ago. So it's quite, quite an old telescope at this stage. Uh, and when it first launched, it was an absolute disaster. You know, if you think of it now, it's, it's this great, successful observatory, but it had some real issues when it first launched, right? The first images returned to Earth were not much better than the images we were getting from tops of mountains, say. So what's the point in building these multi-billion dollar telescope if the images aren't actually any better? And so on the left here, you have a comparison of ground-based data compared to the Hubble data, and it's actually not that much difference. And there was this was a huge, huge embarrassment, embarrassment for NASA. You know, the build the telescope made the front page of the New York Times. NASA built a telescope that couldn't actually focus properly. Huge embarrassment. And, and so the problem was actually one of the, the mirrors on the telescope, the primary mirror which sits at the back of the telescope had the wrong shape. And on the left, we have the mirror that was sent into space made by the Perker Elmer Corporation. And, and so it's interesting. So the, they made this mirror and the mirror passed, passed all the tests that was required to, by NASA to put it into space. But the problem is those tests themselves were faulty. So even though all the tests were you know, green light, the test itself was faulty. And so it was off by a fraction of a you know, thickness of a human hair or something, but that caused all the problems that the telescope had. Uh, the, the mirror on the, the right is the backup mirror made by Kodak, which was coincidentally the absolute perfect shape. So had they used that mirror instead, there would have been no problems whatsoever. Uh, and you can see that now at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. Uh, so initially the Hubble telescope was a bit of a disappointment, but luckily it was built to be serviced by the space shuttle. So you can send astronauts up to replace instruments and replace parts on the telescope to essentially upgrade it. And the first upgrade was three years after launch in 1993. And at that point, they fixed most of these focusing problems by adding additional optics inside the instruments. And so now the telescope was working as it should have been originally, like three years earlier. So since then, we had about, we have, we have, we've had five servicing missions each time upgrading the instruments, upgrading the gyroscopes, for example, to keep the telescope pointed. But since uh, well, the last mission was in 2009, right? And we've not had a sh shuttle since 2011. So the telescope has not been serviced for over a decade. And it's a telescope that's showing signs of age. You know, was it last year that the computers were starting to play up? The gyroscopes have been failing one by one. And so it's an aging telescope, and we obviously wish Hubble all the best for the future. Uh, but you know, it's it's a telescope that will eventually fail. So the legacy of Hubble is absolutely gigantic, though. With, with the Hubble, the images returned from Hubble has really redefined the way we look at our universe. The images have really inspired the next generation of astronomers. Absolutely stunning images. So here's just a few examples. With the bottom right, of course, we have one of the best planets, which is Jupiter, the Sombrero Galaxy, a galaxy that's formed out of a collision between two galaxies, forming this dark dusk ring around the outside. Uh, the Ant Nebula, a supernova of, a, of two stars, effectively, and a star-forming region in the Cone Nebula. This is just 
four of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of images returned by the telescope, which are truly, truly remarkable. So what about James Webb? Well, the beginnings of James Webb was even before Hubble launched, people sat down and started thinking about what kind of telescope are we going to need after Hubble? And this is 1989. And so they call it NGST. It stands for the Next Generation Space Telescope. And the design was, you know, not, not set yet. And so but that's when the process started. And NASA started taking the next generation, you know, what, what would that next generation telescope look like? What would it do? What kind of specifications would it have? And so in the years and decades that follow, the building started. And so whilst the telescope's been developed, the headlines have been bad, <laughs> been really bad. And so here's just a few examples of the headlines uh, that, that the James Webb Space Telescope have garnered over the years. It's been horribly over budget. And so in, in 2011, the American Congress threatened to shut down the whole project because it was just getting too expensive, spiraling costs, a little bit out of control. And so it was, it was saved by a senator called Barbara McCluskey. And in her honor, now the data archive used for both Hubble and James Webb data is named after her. There was an incident where they did an acoustic test, basically mimics the acoustic vibrations at launch, all that noise effectively. So they put the telescope inside this massive chamber. Uh, they close the door, they do the test, <laughs> they open the door back up. At the bottom of the test chamber, they find a handful of screws and a handful of washers. <laughs> and this is uh, not a good test when you find parts of your telescope at the bottom of the testing unit. And so this meant additional delays back to the drawing board to figure out where do these washers come from, where do these nuts bolts come from. You know, this shouldn't happen. So it was bad headline after bad headline, cost overruns after cost overruns, and people were drawing parallels to the Hubble Space Telescope. The problems that the, tele the Hubble had early on, actually, we maybe we're seeing similar things with the James Webb Space Telescope. Maybe NASA aren't as good at this as they think they are, <laughs> or something like that. But we had it, the telescope was built, the telescope was transported to to European spaceport in South America. And just over two years ago, it was launched. And here's what the launch looks like. It was launched on a European rocket. This is one of the major contributions that the European Space Agency did to the project, pro providing a launch vehicle effectively. So it was on Christmas Day, which is nice. You can steady your ner nerves on Christmas Day. It's okay to drink, have a little drink at noon on Christmas Day. And so I was quite nervous, you know, <laughs> a lot of my signs relied on this rocket launching successfully into place, into space, but that it did. And that it did absolutely beautifully as well. And about half an hour later, we got to see the telescope detach from the rocket. And this is the telescope, it's folded up. I'll show you that uh, in the next slide or so, but it's folded up and here we see the telescope moving away into outer space, where it's going to spend its lifetime taking pictures of space. And here we have the first deployment. You can see the solar panel folding out. And now the observatory has power. And this is the last time we've really seen the telescope. And it lives at a position now that's about three times further away than our moon. So we can't actually go there and fix things if things go wrong. But that's all part of the design. Uh, all part of the decisions that were made and it should be it should be fine <laughs> so on its way to that position far outside the moon it had to unfold itself because to fit into the nose cone and the rocket you have to fold it up it's actually a massive massive telescope it's like well we'll see i'll tell you when it's all folded out so here's a very important part of the telescope folding out right now it's one of the sun shields 
The sun shield itself has five layers, and the principle is remarkably so, remarkably simple. It's you know it's like you're on a beach and you're under a parasol. You're gonna you're gonna be a lot cooler if you're away from the rays of the sun rather than when you're sitting in the sun. So in the shade you're gonna be cooler compared to when you're in the sun. And this is a really effective passive cooling mechanism. Uh, so you can see the five layers there. We're about to see the the primary mirror, the secondary mirror fold out, which is on the strut. It's going to sit in front front of the large gold mirror. There it goes. We're going to see the main mirror fold out as well. And this is what the observatory looks like right now. So the sun shield is extremely simple and extremely effective. So on the sun side, which is the bottom side, if you're looking here, uh, it's about 85 degrees Celsius. So it's like a hot cup of tea, essentially. On the shade side, where the telescope lives and where the instrument lives, is minus, minus 240 degrees Celsius. So not that far off from absolute zero. Extremely, extremely cold, extremely, extremely effective way of keeping a telescope cool. Uh, so like any large international space missions, you really need to have an international collaboration because they're large, they're complicated, and they're expensive. So the principal partners for the James Webb Space Telescope is NASA, the American Space Agency, ESA, the European Space Agency, and the, as well, the Canadian Space Agency. And it's a project we've been involved with at the University of Leicester for decades. There are four instruments on board the observatory, and we built parts for one of those instruments. So we've been involved for decades, literally. So on the right, we have a picture of the mid-infrared instrument. I'll go on to talk more about that. And our engineers are over there at Goddard Space Flight Center putting the telescope onto the observatory. So the mid-infrared instrument is interesting. It's effectively a very British instrument. We have Gillian Wright, which is the European principal investigator up at the, U the UK Astronomy Technology Center. So it's, it's the big building on top of Blackford Hill. So if you've ever been to Edinburgh, been to Blackford Hill, you know, it's an absolute stunning setting for astronomy. Well, maybe not for astronomy, but for astronomy technology. We'll also have the Rutherford Appleton Lab uh, in Didcot, as well as University of Leicester involved in building this instrument. Uh, and it's it's different from the other three instruments in many ways. It's the only, it's the only instrument that looks in the very long infrared. So we call it the mid-infrared. The only instrument that covers that wavelength regions. And to observe in this wavelength region, you need to have an extremely cold in instrument. I mean, we talked about the, the telescope and the instruments being minus 240 degrees Celsius. Well, the mid-infrared instrument, MIRI, needs to be a lot colder than that. And it has some really new, clever technology that solves this problem. So we could use helium to cool things to very cool temperatures. But traditionally, on telescopes on the ground, helium has to be replenished almost every night into an instrument to keep it cool. But what they invented was this basically closed system cryocooler, which is shown on there on the left, which keeps the, you don't lose any helium. So it just circles the helium around the instrument, keeping it cool. And it can cool the instrument to seven degrees above absolute zero, which is absolutely remarkable. Another consideration when you have such a cold instrument is that you can't use, say, lubricants you use on the earth for this filter wheel, for example. They basically turn to sand at these kind of temperatures. So that you have to have your engineering decisions are very specific to this extremely cold environment. This filter wheel, for example, is driven by a motor. So imagine you turn a motor on inside the instrument. That motor is going to generate a little bit of heat. And you don't want heat inside your extremely cold instrument. And so they've designed this lever that deals with all the fine positioning of these filters. So you only need to turn the, filter, the motor on for as short a period as possible. And this very clever and simple lever takes care of putting the filter in the exact right position. It's just quite clever, very clever. 
So uh, we talked about the Hubble Space Telescope before. One big difference between these two observatories is the size of the mirrors. So the Hubble mirror is about 2.4 meters, shown on the left there. You got an engineer there for size, for scale, essentially. Now the James Webb Space Telescope absolutely dwarfs this. You can see that on the right. And the Webb mirror is six and a half meters in diameter, so much, much larger. If you have a larger telescope, you collect more photons. And as you can see, basically further back in time in the universe, you get clearer pictures of any stars or planets you're looking at just by collecting more light from that object. It's made out of 18 hexagonal mirrors. Uh, and they, these are gold plated. It's an infrared telescope and gold is really reflective at these wavelengths. So is it, it I mean, not only does it look cool, it also, it also is the most reflective material you can use for this telescope. It's also very clever. Each one of each one of these, well, sorry, each of these individual mirror segments can be, actually be focused individually, and it can be focused in the flight. That means you're never going to have an issue like Hubble had, where you sent up the wrong shaped mirror. This telescope can actually adapt its the shape of its mirror at any given time to correct for any sort of imperfections in the mirror surface or anything like that extremely extremely thought through and extremely clever uh, another big difference between the web sort of the hubble space telescope and the james webb space telescope is that the the web telescope does a lot of spectroscopy and what that means is it basically divides light into its constituent colors and basically like a rainbow right and what's cool about this that every atom and every molecule in the universe has its own unique fingerprint in this color space, in this rainbow space. So say you're looking at a planet orbiting another star, you can actually determine what's in the atmosphere of that star. What if it's nitrogen in that atmosphere? What if it's oxygen in that atmosphere? And you go, hang on, that's just like the Earth. We have nitrogen, we have oxygen, and then maybe you find water in the atmosphere. And then go, you can ask some, some pretty fundamental questions then. Like, is this a planet like the Earth? Is this a planet like the Earth that could also have life? You know, these are fundamental questions that we're trying to understand. Okay, so let me show some actual pictures taken by the observatory. So this, this was... Uh, released a year and a half ago in July, one of the first images to be released. And this is, apart from just a stunning picture, this is the Carina Nebula. Uh, you can sort of imagine you're standing on a cliff here, cliff of gas looking out into the, to the distant universe. And this is a star forming region. In this large, well, enormous volume of gas, new stars are born, sort of like a stellar nursery. So gas is collapsing in on itself, and new stars light up. When they light up, they actually push some of that gas that surrounds it away from the star, and it creates this sort of cavernous structures you can see inside this gas. Uh, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you more pictures, of course, uh, but I'm going to group them into the science goals of the observatory. And, and these science goals really drove the technology development of the observatory. You know, we need a really sensitive telescope because we're going to look at really faint things, for example. So there's four science goals in totals, total. And I thought I'd go through them each individually and show you some pictures that relate to those science goals effectively. So the first one is the end of the dark ages first light and reionization. So the Big Bang happened. At that time, the universe was chaotic. It was extremely hot, a raging battle between matter and antimatter. Matter ultimately won out. The universe expanded extremely rapidly. It was hot. But as something expands, it also cools down. So at some point, we had a universe 
full of lots of hydrogen, but it was completely dark. This we call the Dark Ages. There was no light yet in the universe because the first stars hadn't been born yet. I always think this is like when you're at a, say you're at a big stadium about to see a concert and imagine all the lights are off and then someone takes out their phone and turns on the flashlight. Imagine that's the first star in the universe. And then another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. And suddenly the universe is bathing in light for the first time. This is the end of the dark ages. When the first stars are born, the first stars form the first galaxies. The question we're trying to answer is, what do those first stars look like? What do the first galaxies look like? And here's an example of that. So here's what we call a deep field. So you stare, the telescope stares at a very small patch of sky for a very, very long time. Uh, well, we'll come back to how long in a minute. But So you can see in these exposures, you have hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies appearing in each of these frames. So the, the box, boxes in the middle labeled one is a galaxy believed to be only about 450 years, <laughs> years, 450 million years old after the Big Bang. So just after the end of the Dark Ages, this galaxy was formed. In the box two, you have an even younger galaxy formed perhaps 350 million years after the Big Bang. Extremely, extremely young. We expect these galaxies to be different from the galaxies that we see today. So how do those first galaxies form? What do they look like? What kind of stars do they have? Are all important questions for understanding the evolution of galaxies. And we'll talk about that in a second. Actually, we'll talk about that now. So, so we talk the very early universe. We also have to talk about the formation of galaxies. How do galaxies form? And how do the galaxies evolve over time? So here we have another deep field. And this is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a, a really famous one. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And this is 12 days of the telescope staring at the same patch of sky. The exact same patch of sky for 12 days. And what you get is just extraordinary, right? You get the, a view of, again, hundreds if not thousands of galaxies that we've you know, we never, never seen before, never, ever seen before. And it just appear, right? And this is like looking through time. You do see those very early galaxies as showed in the last slide, but you also see younger galaxies that are, of course, maybe be bigger and brighter towards you. So in this picture, you get a journey of how galaxies evolve from when they're formed, how do they appear in the current epoch, in the current day? So how do galaxies become to... <laughs> So for example, how did the Milky Way, our galaxy, become the galaxy it is today? What's the evolution from being formed to what it is now? How important are the collisions of galaxies for, you know, for shaping the population of galaxies we have today? So this is what Hubble did. Questions are very similar. This is one of the first images released by the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is a zoomed in version of a smaller sky, but it, it shows the point and the power of the James Webb Space Telescope. It took Hubble 12 days to do that previous image. What takes Hubble 12 days, JWST can do in 12 hours. It's just that much more sensitive, extraordinarily sensitive. So there's a circled red dot, and that was at a time believed to be the youngest galaxy ever spotted. That's a record has been, you know, usurped already and it's going to happen again and again and again because this is one of the main science drivers of the telescope this is why the telescope is so sensitive to see these faint galaxies okay the third science goal is the formation formation of stars and planetary systems so this is a really young star so what we have here is actually 
two stars being formed at the same time, and they're formed in the middle inside that dark dusk, dusk disk, dusk disk, hard to say. So here we have stellar winds basically pushing away out from the star, from the poles of the stars, and you get these collisions with the surrounding materials. So what you have on the left and on the right are shock fronts of material flowing out from the star, colliding with the surrounding atoms and molecules that just hang around. So we know it's a binary star because the, the jets just coming out of that dark, dusty region actually are really wiggly. <laughs> They're wobbly. Technical term, wibbly and, <laughs> wiggly and wobbly. Uh, and that means that actually this is a binary star. The only way you get that pattern is you have two stars orbiting each other. If it was a single star, it would be a lot more well-ordered, say. So we're talking about the formation of stars and within, around those stars, we also have the formation of planets. So how do stars form out of these big, vast volumes of gas? And how do planets form around those stars? So here's a really interesting catchily named LG1527, L1527. This is, imagine what our own solar system looked like about four and a half billion years ago. Again, we have a dusk disk right at the middle. That's where the star is formed. Again, we have those shock fronts coming out from, from the poles of the star out into the surrounding space. And you can imagine, this is what the solar system maybe looked like. Now, inside that disk is a young Earth being formed, a young Jupiter being formed, a young solar system being formed. And getting the high definition views we get with the James Webb Space Telescope, it's really going to open up our understanding of how these systems are formed and ultimately how our own solar system was created. This, this is one of my favorite pictures. I love this. This is famous, uh, made famous by Hubble. So the Hubble image is shown on the, on the left and the James Webb image is shown on the right. So this is the, the star forming regions within these fingers of gas New stars are born, again, another stellar nursery, right? What's cool about, well, you can see the difference. Let's start there. So the Hubble Space Telescope is quite hazy. You can't actually see that many stars in that picture. But you compare, compare that to the James Webb Space Telescope picture, you can see a lot more stars. And that, that's because in the infrared, you can actually see through dust. And if you can see through dust, you can actually see into where these stars are being born. And so seeing through dust is a powerful tool, which means we can explore the universe in greater detail than actually Hubble did, because a lot of the, well, this is a good example, a lot of the science we're trying to get to is obscured by this dust. It also means you're likely to see further back in time as well. The fourth science goal is uh, planetary systems and the origins of life. Very ambitious, very ambitious target. So what kinds of planets, what kind of planets are there out there? At this stage, we've discovered something like five, over 5,000 different planets around other stars. What are these planets like? Do these, do these planets have the conditions for life, for example? And this is where spectroscopy come in. We talked about a little bit about spectroscopy earlier. So this is where you can break the light into its infrared colors, and you can determine what kind of molecules, what kind of atoms are present in these planets. So here's an example. This is an exoplanet, so a planet around another star. And you can see there's all these different elements which you can basically tell by the wiggle in that line what kind of elements are present in this planet's atmosphere. And so this is nothing like the Earth. Think of, of like a big Jupiter with some clouds. There is water in the atmosphere. We have sort of silicates in the, in the clouds, a lot of methane. So it's very similar to Jupiter, but maybe a lot hotter. So not a good candidate perhaps if you're looking for something like the Earth, but it shows you 
the power of this technique. You can you can figure out what's in the atmosphere of this planet just by looking at its spectrum, its spectroscopy. Another thing, another really cool thing you can do with the James Webb Space Telescope is that you can actually take pictures of planets around other stars. And this is a very, very simple technique, but it's, it's ingenious, right? So we call this coronography. And what you do, well, I'm gonna take, take a step back. The, the challenge is, the brightness of a star is maybe like 10,000 or 100 times brighter than that of a planet that orbits that star. So it's a real contrast issue. If you have 10,000 to one or 100,000 to one, that's really hard to take a picture of, you know? So what you do, this is so simple. You take a little disc and you place it over the star, essentially, that blocks out the light of the star. And that, that way, you don't see the star, but you see what's around it. And that's what you see at the bottom here. The star symbol indicates the location of the star, but of course, that's blocked out, so you can't see it. And what you see instead is a planet that orbits that star. So we can actually take, we can actually take planet, pictures of planets directly. Amazing. Uh, so I want to talk to you little bit about what I do, what I'm using the telescope for. And I'm using it to look at the giant planets in our solar system. So Jupiter, iconic belts and zones, these atmospheric, very strong winds moving across the planet. The Great Red Spot, very famous. Galileo saw this storm over 300 years ago, 350 years ago, however long it was. <laughs> uh, and it's the largest storm in the solar system. You can fit the entirety of the Earth inside that storm. It tells you how large these planets are, right? You have Saturn with its iconic rings. And out in the outer solar system, you have Uranus and Neptune, you know, living very, very cold lives out there. What I'm really interested in is the northern lights of these planets. I mentioned the northern lights right at the beginning. And here's a movie taken from the International Space Station so basically flying over the North Pole and the camera's looking down, taking pictures of the Northern Lights, these green, reds and purples. So these are charged particles that impact the atmosphere. And these charged particles must come from somewhere. And so the question is, where do these charged particles from, come from that produce Northern Lights? And really, before the space age, this was really difficult to really understand. Uh, but this guy, a clever guy, Norwegian guy, I think probably a bit of a genius, he wrote his first scientific paper when he was 18 years old. He's been nominated for the Nobel Prize seven times, never won it. Uh, but he built basically a uh, aurora in a box, a northern lights in a box. And he figured out, well, he postulated anyway, that the charged particles that produce the northern lights must come from the sun. There can't be any other source of charged particles around the earth. So he said, they must come from the sun. Uh, and really the first view of the space between the earth and the sun came with Pioneer 5, the first spacecraft to leave the protective bubble of our magnetic field it spent maybe it was eight weeks or something in the space between Earth and Venus. And what it discovered, by the way, isn't it funny how different spacecraft used to look in the 60s compared to what it looks like now, just balls or things. Anyway, side note, uh, this spacecraft discovered that in interplanetary space, the space between the planets, is completely filled with, with charged particles. And these charged part particles actually come from the sun. The sun is extremely active. It throw, throws out material all the time. So see there an example on the right. We call this the solar wind. It's sort of a nautical analogy, if you like. And this solar wind travels from the sun towards the earth. The, magnetic field of the earth creates this protective bubble around us. And so it keeps us safe, but the magnetic field actually catches some of those charged particles 
some of those charged particles enter the magnetic field and they get funneled down onto the northern pole and the southern pole to produce northern and southern lights. So what about Jupiter? Well, Jupiter has the ingredients you, you need, we think we need, to produce northern lights. It has a very strong magnetic field. In fact, it's 18,000 times stronger than that of the Earth. And if you can see the cavity that the Jupiter's magnetic field carves out against the solar wind, it would be by far the largest structure in the night sky. And it goes all the way down to the, to the orbit of Saturn. Huge structure. So this is what the northern lights of Jupiter look like. It was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, the Earth approximately to scale there. And this thing is not enormous, right? And very, very energetic. There's more energy being produced here than all of the power plants on Earth combined. Stunning. And we can ask the same question then. Where did the charged particles come from that produced the normal lights of Jupiter? Well, there is a clue in this picture. It's, of course, not easy to spot, but there is a dot in the, at the, right at the bottom of the sort of trail of the aurora. If you follow that dot out into the volume around Jupiter, you're going to hit a pretty special place, and that's the moon Io. On the right, you have a temperature, so on the left, you have a temperature map of Io. This, everywhere, anywhere is bright, it's hot. And so each of those individual dots are individual volcanoes, absolutely littered with volcanoes, the most volcanic place in the solar system. In the movie on the right, you can actually see one of these volcanoes kicking off. And these volcanoes throw stuff out in the volume around Jupiter. This gets charged, and actually, at Jupiter, the northern lights, or the aurora, are fueled by these volcanoes. I I just think it's, it's like sci-fi, right? <laughs> I do this for a living, and I still think it's such a trip. These volcanoes actually produce the stuff that generates the northern lights at Jupiter. I, th I think it's wonderful. Right, we talk about James Webb. Let's return to James Webb. This was the first picture returned of Jupiter, July last year. Uh, it's July last year? I know, maybe the year before. Uh, anyway, stunning, right? This is a view of Jupiter in the infrared. You can see the northern, northern lights in red, the top, the southern lights in the bottom, incredible definition of the great red spot and all the weather storms you see here. You can play around with the contrast of this image a little bit. You begin to see things that you're not actually used to seeing using telescope the ground, for example. One of the most obvious of these are the rings of Jupiter. You can see on the side there. You, you don't think of Jupiter as a planet with rings, like Saturn, for example, but there they are showing up because we're using a telescope built to detect the first galaxies in the universe, and we're pointing it at one of the brightest objects in the night sky, which is Jupiter. And that's why we can see things we're not used to seeing, because the telescope is so incredibly insensitive. Uh, last year, we got pictures of Saturn as well. This is a, also a quite a strange picture of Saturn. It doesn't really look like we're used to seeing Saturn. It's this is taken at an infrared wavelength that Saturn basically absorbs all the sunlight that it receives. So that renders the disk of Saturn extremely dark. But of course, we can see the glorious rings, Dione, Enceladus, and Tethys, three moons of Jupiter. Enceladus, interestingly, like Io at Jupiter, is an active moon. It has cryovolcanism that spews that material into the volume around Saturn. And so that can be a contributing factor to the northern lights we see at that planet. We've looked at Uranus as well. Stunning. Again, we have rings. All the giant planets in our solar system have some sort of ring system. We can see a bright storm in the bottom left, a bright polar cap. 
Uh, Uranus is a weird planet. It rotates on its side, like you can see, but it's a really bright polar cap. Individual storms as well. We've looked at Neptune. And I love this picture because what we want to do is just take a picture of Neptune, right? But what you get sort of free of charge is this background field of galaxies. We just pick them up because the telescope is so sensitive. <laughs> it's just but it's just there, it's just pop out because it's so sensitive, right? You can see Triton, so the turquoise dot right at the top of this image. That's believed to be a captured Kuiper Belt, Kuiper Belt object, which is now a moon or Neptune. It could even be an active moon. We can zoom in on Neptune as well. And here we have it again, another ring system. We can see these really bright clouds at Neptune. And these clouds are interesting. They change really, really fast. And so by using this telescope, we can sort of begin to do meteorology for the first time at an ice giant, at Uranus or Neptune. Yeah, it's, it's seeing these images for the first time was remarkable for me. You know, it's so much of my career has been leading up to the launch of the telescope and to look at this data and actually get data back from the telescope that we can begin to work with is extraordinarily gratifying. I feel lucky to be able to do this kind of science. I'm going to show one more slide, which is this one here. Uh, right at the center, so about halfway down the center, this is a picture of another star forming regions. You get that background field of galaxies again, but there is this coincidental co cosmic question mark if you can see it right in the middle and that's sort of a fitting end to this talk i think there is so much we have yet to learn this is really only the beginning of what this telescope can do so i'd urge you to keep an eye out for whatever comes next whatever new exciting science i'm going to be able to do with this telescope it could possibly be you that do it, right? So thank you very much.